a name. On his heart, whatever. <laughs> my name. Why would he write my name? Amen. I ain't worthy to have my name written anywhere on Christ. In his hand, his heart. Amen. It's all because God chose me. It's all because he loved me and sought me out and found me. Amen. Man. That's what we need to realize. Amen. And God's looking for all these other people. And guess what? He wants to use you to get them. Amen. Amen. Mike, will you pray? God, I'm just really thankful that we can gather into your house. And I'm thankful that, we, that you are in our midst. Lord, we just want to pray that you can be our teacher. Lord, open our eyes and ears and our hearts to receive what you would have to say to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, the first thing that I can say is I'm really glad that we uh, don't record the sound or the music portion because I sing like a buffalo. <laughs> Especially tonight. Is it recording already? You already got me singing like a buffalo. Here I am messing this whole program up, Wesley. Well, I want to go ahead and tell you, number one, we want to pray for... Pearl Hannah's family. Is this? Yeah, we're on. Awesome. I want to pray for Pearl Hannah's family. She passed away uh, this morning about 11.30 noon, something like that. Um, Matt, can you go make sure this mic comes up just a little bit? Uh, but pray for her family. Her sister was there. Her son was there. Be praying for them. Uh, also, be, keep Susan Walter and Teresa Hargis in your prayers. Their mother died and her funeral was today. Uh, continue to pray for my family. My Uncle Bobby passed away um, yesterday. Uh, also, forgetting one, I know I am. Uh, pray for the Rex Winkle family. I'm going to be doing a funeral for their uh, loved one on Saturday as well. So be praying for them. I think that's all I have. Be praying for our church. Be praying for me. Be praying for each other. Be praying for this church. Be praying for the people we're trying to reach. Amen. Uh, for my Uncle Tony. Your Uncle Tony. I knew I was forgetting yeah. one. Okay. Tony Morgan. Morgan. You need to be praying for Tony Morgan. Huh? Andrew, be praying for Andrew. No, I, it, they live in Independence, so it'd be, it's, it, I think they only come when they're able to. Um, it had been quite a little while since we saw uh, Letitia, the girl that he came with. So I think they, I think they may have a place they go over there, and if they don't, uh, it's just the distance. You know what I mean? So be praying for them for sure. Uh, be praying for Joey, who uh, surprised us a couple Sunday nights ago. Be praying for him. Uh, Kyle, you want to come up here and pray for all these? Yeah, sure. Oh, gracious Father, Lord, we come to you tonight. Lord, we accept you as the only comforter and the sustainer and the lover of our soul. Father God, we ask you that you would be with these ones who have lost loved ones. We ask that you would be with Susan and with Teresa as they grieve the loss of their mother. Father God, we just pray that you would be with Miss Pearl's family. Lord, as they are grappling with this recent loss father we pray that you would be there by your spirit comfort them give them the peace of the holy ghost that passes all understanding 
Father God, we just pray for Pastor Kevin's family, for his uncle Bobby, Lord. We just pray that you would be there and strengthen him when his strength is small, that he would know that his hope is in the Lord, Father God. Father, we just pray for these that have been here and have not been back. Father God, we pray that you would draw them to yourself and where they are, that they would find a church to get plugged into, Lord, that they would desire to grow in grace and in holiness and in love for you and for the brethren. Father God, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would comfort and guide all those who need it. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come and guide us, Father, in the teaching and the proclamation of your word and your gospel. Father, we just pray that you would give Pastor Kevin your words to preach your message of your son who loved us and gave himself for us. And it's in his name, the name of Christ, we pray. All right. Well, I think I think it's this microphone again, the bottom of it. That's why that's why I was not hearing it very well. But anyway, uh, I want to I want to start off by saying I really intend to get back to Genesis, but I can't help preach something else when Genesis isn't really needed. Okay, and I'm not saying that the Word of God is unnecessary. What I'm saying is we live in a time and a season uh, that people, for whatever reason, who name the name of Christ, think that A, trouble's not going to come, B, that uh, we don't have to have a certain way that we live. Can I say it that way? They, they want Christ, but they don't want any demands on them. Right? Like Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself. You know, uh, uh, sell all. He told the rich young ruler, sell all that you have. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. And I think it's important for us to understand as Christians. You know, I talked for several weeks about what the gospel was, right? And then I talked about what prayer is, right? And I also talked about what, what it means to be a part of the church. Amen? I talked about the necessity of church. I talked about why church is important. Why being a member of a church is important. Amen? All these things are things that are important for the Christian life. Amen? Let me ask you a question. Okay? 
okay? This is exactly why the verse of Scripture is written that says, let not the foot say, since I'm not the hand, I'm not part of the body. Amen? Paul dealt with in his day people who were trying to divorce themselves from the gathered body of believers, the church. Amen? And we are allowing, Christianity is allowing people to try to redefine what church is. I listened to it at the annual meeting the Southern Baptist just yesterday. A man got up and was asking about, uh, because now the Kansas-Nebraska Convention of Southern Baptist is letting satellite churches or uh, multi-site churches, you know, have a representation within the convention, which I think is a good thing. A satellite church is just a church that meets at another place. They're still part of this church, but because there's uh, it's such a distance to go over there, they're just going to branch out and have a satellite church over there. Okay? That's great. Multi-site churches are nearly the same thing other than the fact that they're autonomous, different churches. You know what I mean? They're multi-site. They have a church head, right? But... All those things are great. And then there was a man that stood up and said, well, what about online church? And I just started shaking my head because I love these people and they have good ideas, but church is not church online, okay? It's no different than sitting at home watching a TV preacher. You may be listening to a good message. You may be hearing the word of God, but that's not church. The word church means, uh, e uh, ecclesia means the gathering, the gathering together of believers, amen, the body, the, the corporate public meeting of God's people. That's the church. That doesn't happen online, okay, I'm sorry. That there's so much that doesn't happen online that you can't do online. Amen? Oh, I can pray for my brother online. Sure, I can pray for people over the Facebook waves. Sure, I can. But there's something different when you meet together. Because here's the main thing that everyone's trying to get out of. Accountability. Amen. Accountability. That's what people don't want. That's why they stop going to church. Oh, I stopped going to church because they're really judgmental. Maybe they are. Or maybe you're walking in sin and you don't want to hear it. Because in all reality, I've had those words come out of my mouth. They're judgmental. But what was really going on is there was sin in my life that I didn't want exposed. Yeah. There was things going on in me that I knew if they knew, they would have a problem with. Amen? Most church members that leave a church and say, oh, they're leaving because they're this way too judgmental. I didn't fit in. Oh, they're not nice. What they're really saying is there was a situation that came up in my life and they told me I was wrong and they showed me the biblical reason why I was wrong. And instead of submitting to the church, do you realize the church is meant to submit one to another? Isn't that what Paul said? Submit you one to another. Right? He says it to the Ephesians, he says it to the Corinthians, he says it to the Galatians. I mean, at some point, we probably ought to listen to God's word. Amen? Amen? Uh, I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. Yeah, I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. Yeah. Well, it can't be full of hypocrites if you're not there, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answer, okay? Because the reality is, we all are hypocrites at one point or another. Amen? 
And, and even the most devout Christian person can get so full of their self that they become hypocritical on a certain thing. Amen? That's an excuse. And the reason the church is declining, the reason the church will, will not grow, the reason that the church is uh, seemingly falling short is not, it's not because people inside are being this way or that way. What's really happening is there's no submission one to another. There's no accountability. Nobody wants to be accountable. Amen? Online home church, you don't have to be accountable. You can amen somebody. You can put your best clothes on right after you get done doing whatever you did that was probably sinful anyway. And then turn the camera on and be like, I'm in church. I'm ready. Show up in the chat room. Pray for me. But there's no accountability. There's no iron sharpening iron. There's none of that. I want to read to you a portion of scripture tonight. And this is James talking to believers of the 12 tribes who gather together, by the way. This is not to a single person. It's to believers, the churches. Amen. So as we read James chapter 1, I want to go through this, but I want you to see slowly that James is trying to tell them that you have to live different. Amen? Christians today want so much to look like the world, sound like the world, that we forget that we're not supposed to be like the world. What fellowship? Do the, does the believer have with the unbeliever? Remember that question? What fellowship does darkness have with light? What fellowship does the church of Christ, the church of God, would be, be like? What fellowship do we have? What fellowship should we have? None! So I'm going to begin in James chapter 1, and we're just going to read through it. And then we're going to parse it out just real simply, real practically. Amen? James chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes that are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. How many of you want that in your life? How many of you want that in your spiritual life, to be perfect, entire, and wanting nothing. It comes through patience. Oh, I got another word for you. Endurance. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> patience. What's the ESV use there? Or you got your King James tonight. Anybody got an ESV? I can turn there. Yeah, turn there in that little ESV. I'm going to keep reading, okay? But let patience have her perfect work. That ye be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Verse 4. Uh, uh, yeah, 4. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect. Steadfastness. Steadfastness. Oh, how many of us need that? Does, isn't there a part of the Bible that says, be ye steadfast and immovable, right? Steadfast means I know what the Word of God says, I'm going to stand by the Word of God, and I'm not going to be moved from the Word of God. Don't we need that? Because we're tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. We're, oh, does it mean this? And oh, does it mean that? And oh, right? Everybody questioning manhood. Everybody questioning womanhood. 
like it's not a reality, right? Like you can't go in the bathroom and pull your pants down and find out if you're a girl or a boy. That's how ridiculous it is. I know it sounds crass the way I said that just now. I know that sounds in your face, but the reality is it's that simple. We're being asked to deny fundamental reality to believe things nowadays. Even in the church. Oh, oh, oh. No, you tell me the man's the head of the house? Nope. The Bible says it. Over and over and over. I mean, that's hardcore, right? It really stinks because we got a lot of lovely ladies that because I remember when I first preached on 1 Timothy chapter 2. I had a whole bunch of people going, oh, that's not right. That's not right, Pastor. Oh, you're just being sexist. Am I? Or am I reading what the Word of God says and telling you it and you don't like it? That's terrible, right? Like, when did it become unchristian to read Paul's words in Ephesians where it says the man is the head of the house, the head of the woman, the head of the wife, right? Where Peter says the man is the head of his wife. It's flabbergasting to me. Have you noticed that in our culture, have you noticed in our culture, they do everything to help mothers, they do everything to help children. They'll do everything to help transgender and homosexuals. But if you're a heterosexual male, it's wrong. You, they don't help you. There's no support for you. If you go on a certain website that I'm not going to name, they will support gays and homosexuals and women and children. But they mention nothing about fathers. They mention nothing about men. Because the goal of our country is to tear down the family. Right. And in tearing the family down, they will tear the church down. Because God has the same institute for the church. And we don't like that either. Amen? Why is this all relevant? Because it's all about being steadfast. If I would rather believe what culture says or what the, look, I love you, but the Bible isn't a feminist manifesto. I love you, but the Bible isn't a uh, equitable manifesto. The Bible clearly from the very beginning shows God working out his plan of salvation for man. Amen. And it talks about how God set up the home. It talks about how God set up his church. And if we don't believe what it says about the home and the church, we're lost. You want to know why we have a gender identity crisis in America? Because we've taken the role of biblical manhood and we've trashed it. We've taken the role of biblical womanhood, motherhood, wifehood, and we've trashed it. And it's not popular to talk about what the Bible says about those things. Because when you do, you get called old-fashioned. You get called a misogynist. Because, oh, you're just in it for men, to promote men. No. I'm in it to tell you what God's word says, the best way we should live. Amen? Now, for all of those that think I'm just banging on women right now, the Bible says to submit yourself, husband and wife, one to another. <laughs> but that doesn't change the fact that the man is still the head of his wife. Amen? And it doesn't change the fact that men are supposed to die to their self and live for their wife. <laughs> Amen? And when we refuse to uphold what the Bible says about that and 
you get a cowardly man instead of sacrificially giving himself for his wife. He's making his wife sacrifice in that way. Right. And that's right. Cowardly. So we got lost on that rabbit trail of being <laughs> but, steadfast. Yeah. He said, but let patience or steadfastness have a perfect work. You want to know why the family isn't perfect and entire and wanting nothing? It's because we won't submit to what the Word of God says about the family, about men, women, life, church. We won't do it. We refuse to follow what God's Word says. Now, why is this all important? Let's keep reading. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave, driven, driven and tossed by the wind, or uh, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man. What does that mean? A double-minded man. Let's think about that for a second. Let's dwell right here for a second. A double-minded man is a man who says, I want to follow Christ and I think this is right, but I heard somebody else say this and I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just now I'm just caught in confusion. Do you see that God is not the author of confusion? And confusion normally only comes because we won't believe what the plain meaning of the Word of God says. The plain meaning of the Word of God. Let, look, I, I, I'm going to do something. This might be hurtful, okay? But it's the Word of God, and we're going to read it for just a second. Okay? So don't, don't shoot me, Ruth, okay? Please don't throw anything. No hard objects. So we won't believe the main, the plain reading of the text, and we make excuses for it, and we'll try to talk our way out of it, right? Watch this. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, or to usurp authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam not, was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was a transgre transgression. Transgressive. Golly. Now, when you read that, if you go look up commentaries or you listen to pastors, what they'll do is they'll spend 45 minutes either explaining this, or explaining in a way. Amen. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't mean what it says it means. Really? How come he says nearly the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 14? How come he says nearly the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? How come he says nearly the same thing in Ephesians and Galatians? And I mean, we could go on, but the reality is we don't like this verse. It challenges us, right? The reason it challenges us is because of sin. Do you realize that Adam, when he was made, was made and given the law, said, hey, don't touch this tree, name all the animals, before Eve was ever even made. And before the fall, Eve had no problem understanding that Adam was the head because he was made first. And she had no problem submitting unto Adam because he was made first. Amen? After the fall, we have the words, but your desire shall be for your husband. And that word, for him, actually means against him. You're, wanting, you're going to want to go against him and work against him. Okay? Watch this. Go to Genesis. I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. The result of the fall was tension in the marriage. Before the, marriage, before the fall... Adam was the head, and Eve had no problem with it. After the fall, there's tension. There's a war between men and women. Who's going to be in charge? Happens all the time in your relationship, doesn't it? So go to Genesis chapter 3, and then we'll go back. Because this is important. I don't know why we're doing this, but 
We're going to do it now that we're on it, okay? All right. Unto the woman, verse 16, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now watch this. This desire, this desire for her husband is not a desire that's good. Okay? There'll be some commentators that go, oh, this desire means she's going to love her husband and want to serve her husband. That's not what this means. The word that's used here for desire actually means I want to overtake you, overrule you. Your desire now is to go, I'm in charge. I'm in charge. I'm in charge. And the husband, likewise, his response is, now I'm going to use my authority the wrong way and treat you like I'm in charge. It creates tension in the marriage. Now, what's the ESV say there? You got it open? Who's got an ESV open? You got it open? What's it say in verse 16? The very end. I want to. I want to hear it out of there. No, no. Just before that, too. The part about the the wife first. You can read the whole thing. It's fine. Okay. The woman said, "I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing, and pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you." Mm -hmm. He says, "For against any desire." Mm -hmm. Against. See, that word there that's used for desire is not a for or towards. It uses for right there, but then they explain it with a footnote saying it, it means against. This desire for her husband or toward her husband is to say, no, I'm in charge. And then it says, and the husband will rule over you. So the punishment was that now Eve was going to want to usurp Adam and Adam was going to want to uh, put his thumb on Eve and say, oh no, I'm the man, I'm in charge. And you know we do that, right? With, oh, you know, puffed up like gorillas, pounding chest, and the wife's always, oh no, no, you're going to do it my way, right? Because that's part of the fall. Part of the fall is tension in the marriage. Before the fall, Adam was the head, Eve was made second, and there was no tension. Nobody was vying for position. They knew their role. They knew how God had created them. How do I know that? This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. He didn't say, hey, wife, I'm going to rule over you. Because their desire wasn't there. What happened in the fall was this tension was caused by sin. Amen? And when we flip back to James, if you flip back to James, we're going to read this again just so you can get it. Where did they put James in my Bible? There it is. Here's a good spot. We're in James 1. But a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And what happens to be double-minded is this. The Word of God clearly says something. And you go, well, is that what it really means? Right? Think about it. Murder is wrong. Well, we don't do that about murder, do we? Some people do, obviously. What about what about um, what about this one? Um, homosexuality is wrong. Well, does it really mean that? That's being double-minded. The Word of God says something, and you know it says something, and then you want to do anything you can to not do that. 
That's being double-minded. And you're not going to walk in faith that way because you're not believing the Word of God, let alone doing the Word of God. Okay? Do you want to be perfect, entire, and wanting nothing? You probably ought to do what the Word of God says. So if the Word of God says the husband's ahead of the wife, enjoy that. Go, God, teach me what it means to be a wife. Teach me what it means to be a husband. How do we live in this pre-fall life that Adam and Eve had before sin entered into the world where they weren't uh, threatened by the other person having this authority? You know what I mean? We also got to understand the man being the head doesn't mean he's in charge. It means he's answerable to God for everything else in the house. That's a big deal. It's a very big deal. God's in charge. The man's just the head. He's the one that has to answer for what goes on in his home. I'm going to keep going. I felt like that was about the end of that. <laughs> Let the brother of low degree rejoice that when he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Now we're back to temptation, right? We started out. Count it all joy, right? How many, how many of you have ever been tempted in your life? Where are you going, man, I'm so blessed that I got tempted. <laughs> Count it all joy that this temptation's come on me. No, most of the time we're going, God, take this thing away from me. I don't want it. Amen. But we need to rejoice. Be exceedingly glad. He said, count it all joy when you fall into these temptations. Blessed is the man that endureth temptations. That's the one that goes through. For when he is tried, he shall receive a, receive a crown of life which the Lord has promised them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, nor tempted to any man. Now, first of all, we know God tests men, right? There's a difference between tempting and testing. Amen? Remember, just this past Sunday, we are talking about uh, Philip and the Lord, you know, handing out the 5,000, you know, the loaves and the fishes, the five loaves and two fish. He tested Philip, right? It says he tested him, he proved him, right? Wanted to see where Philip's faith was. God will do that, but he will never tempt you with evil. Why? Because God can't be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt any man. God is not the tempter. Satan is the tempter. Your flesh will tempt you. Your desires will tempt you. God will not. Uh, he does allow it, that's for sure. <laughs> now, he shall receive crown life, which the Lord has promised them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. Then when lust is conceived and brings forth sin, sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now watch this. He gives you a, a warning. Do not ever, my beloved brethren, every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variable or variableness, excuse me, neither a shadow of turning. Now, hold on, you go, hold on. What is he talking about, good and perfect gifts? What are those things? He doesn't tell us what they are. No, but he tells you what the things that are wicked are. Let's keep reading. <clears throat> of his 
own will, of his own will begat he us, with of his own will begat he up, begot he us, with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Now I want you to understand. I want you to understand this because there's a lot of people that will go, Oh, you can, you can be mad. You can be uh, upset with people and you can do it with, you know, with love. And you know, as long as you don't sin. But if we're working wrath, we're working judgment. And wrath is God's. Judgment is God's. Amen? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, right? Jesus said that the Father has given him all judgment. Amen? We just got through reading that in John. The Father has given him all judgment. All judgment falls to the Son, not you. Amen? Wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, now he's about to tell you what not to do, okay? Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness, all superfluidity of naughtiness. Now that superfluidity, if you don't know what that means, that means an excess, an overabundance. Amen? Now, what does the ESV say there? In verse 21, the first, about the first half of that sentence, you can go ahead and read it. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which they will receive yourself. Rampant wickedness. Do you think we got some rampant wickedness in the church? I think we got rampant wickedness in the church when we have people saying what God calls evil is good. I think we have. Rampant wickedness in the church when the Bible says one thing and we say another. Supposing theologians who say, oh no, it doesn't mean this, it means this. Even though the clear reading of the text says one other thing. Amen? Now watch this. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. See, it's really interesting when people start making a case that, oh, I don't have to, I don't have to quit being a fornicator. I don't have to quit being an adulterer. I don't have to quit whatever. Name, name one thing that you can think of. You don't have to quit those to be saved. That's true. But the reality is, God has an expectation of what his people are to act like. Amen? Born again people are to lay those things aside. Lay them down. Amen? Now, he said, since we're encompassed round about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us and run with patience. Steadfastness, the race that's set before us. Amen? Come on, people. That's why when the Bible says don't forsake the gathering together of yourselves is the custom of some, and you go, I don't have to go to church. You're not walking in the truth. You're walking in lies. Rebellion. Amen? You're being double-minded. Knowing the word of God says one thing and then saying, I don't have to do that. Let's keep reading. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he who beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Now, isn't it interesting the terminology used here, okay? He goes and looks in a mirror, and when he walks it away, he forgets what manner of man he was. Now, 
Nowhere in literature is manner talked about being the physical visage of someone. Manner always applies to how you live, how you behave, not what you actually look like. So this is a metaphor that he's using here for you to see the manner of man you should be. Amen? And the mirror is God's word. The mirror is God's word. We look boldly into God's word to see who we really are and who we need to be. Amen? Now I'm going to keep reading this and then i got a little note that I want to read to you. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goes his way and straightway forgiveth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. But if any man among you seems to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. Now I want you to catch this, okay? There's two times in this section that he says we're deceiving ourselves. Right? When he says... You have to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, deceiving yourself. See, the deception is just to hear the word of God, just to have the knowledge of God's word. Oh, all you got to do is know about it. No, you need to know it and apply it. Uh, saving faith is not a faith that just hears, that just knows, but it's an effectual faith that is applied that causes a man to repent. And believe. That's saving faith. Saving faith produces something. It produces a change. It produces fruit. Merely hearing the word is not enough. We deceive ourselves if we think that. And secondly, he says, If a man among you seems to be religious and bridled not his tongue, but deceives his own heart. This man's religion is vain. You see, it's one thing to deceive others. It's another thing for your tongue to deceive even you. Because then you're walking knowingly in a lie. You're looking at the Word of God, seeing exactly who you are and saying, nope, that's not me. Bridling your tongue doesn't just mean cursing or profanity. Bridling your tongue means saying what God's word says and not what you want it to say. It means believing exactly what God's word says and not trying to talk your way out of it. I know a whole lot of preachers I wish God would, you know, just send an angel down and shut their mouth like he did those lions. Now get this. Pure religion. Oh, I don't I know we don't like that word, right? Well, we don't like we're not religious. It's a relationship. James knew Jesus Christ. James saw the risen Christ. And here James says, pure religion, undefiled before God and the Father, is this to visit the fatherless. The widows, uh, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their distress, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Unspotted from the world. What does is, what is your King James say? Does it say unspotted? Okay, make sure. Make sure we get to the same King Jimmy here. So he says, and most time, when, if you've heard this verse, people only quote the first part of this. 
all pure and undefiled religion is to visit the fatherless and the home, or to visit the fatherless and the widow. And they stop. And they stop on purpose. Because we don't want accountability. We don't want people to go, hey, brother, why are you doing this when you shouldn't be, right? We don't want that. We don't want accountability. I don't want you telling me I'm wrong. Why would you do that? Right? How do I keep myself spotless from the world? I'm, can I let you know a whole secret? Number one, you're not going to do it by yourself. You're not going to do it without the help of the Holy Ghost, okay? Number two, God didn't build the church with just you in it. So you're not going to keep yourself spotless and undefiled from the world without your brother and sister in Christ. This is the whole point that we as a church have to meet together. So that when I'm in error, you can tell me. When you're in error, I can tell you. When we're both lost, somebody else can walk up to us and say, you both are crackpots. We need that. We need people that that check and balance in the church is vital. And I say all this to you because James is not writing one person. He's writing 12 whole tribes scattered throughout the world. Who we'll all meet together, who we'll all pray together and talk together. And if you keep reading this, you'll understand slowly in, in, in the book of James. So he starts out with chapter one, where he's talking about being a doer of the word. Chapter two, what's chapter two about? That's like the most famous one. Faith without works is dead. Amen. Why is he telling us all this? Because we have got to put to practice. The things that we learn. They have to be implemented. Or we're not going to grow. We're not going to be perfect and, and entire and wanting nothing. Without a faith that causes me to be a doer. And not just a hearer. Amen. We are living in a nation who for the last 50 years has suffered a bunch of hearers and not a lot of doers. A lot of people want to go to church and hear a fancy message, but they don't want to be challenged to go do anything with what they heard. Amen? So, as we close, and I'm going to close, amen, I want to I want to pray, but I would rather pray all together. If you guys can come up here, I want to pray with each other. The Bible says pray for one another, pray with one another, amen. amen. I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. I want you to pray for me. I mean, all together, we're going to pray, okay? But I want to pray that we are serious about this. You know what I mean? Serious about not just following Christ, but understanding that just like we can't divorce Christ from the, as the head of the church, we can't chop it off. Can't chop the foot off. Can't chop the finger off. Amen? Just like, just like the church can't exist without the head, it can't exist without the foot. Can't exist without the heart, the lung, the Eyeballs, you know, I mean, we can't. We need everybody, amen? So, I would, everybody come over here, we're going to pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you, God, for your word. Lord, I, I, I have no idea why I really felt led to preach this message, God, other than it, it just falls right in line with what we've been talking about about being accountable, about, about being part of a body, God. We need this kind of message, God, because the church that is not going is a church that is not growing. God, you told us in Matthew 28 that we're to go into all the world. We're to go into all the world, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would help this church, help me, 
Help these people here tonight, God, not to just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of your word. God, let us not deceive ourselves into thinking, oh, we're fine, we're just the way we are, we're all right. Lord, let us not deceive ourselves with lies or deception on our tongue, God, but let us understand that it's the person who is doing and going. That person is the one that's going to grow. That's the person that's going to be blessed in his deeds. God, we pray that you would help us. Not for blessing's sake, not for our sake even, God, but for your glory. Let this church be an example of what it is to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. Let this church be a church that has bridled its tongue with the word of God. Lord, let this church be a church that won't deceive itself about what the Word of God says, but believes wholeheartedly what the plain meaning of the text means. Help us to have pure and undefiled religion before you, God. Help us care for the, the fatherless and the widows around us, God, and help us to keep ourselves spotless before you and we understand that we don't do any of this God without your help there's no way there's no value no strength no greatness in us that could do any of these things it is only done by your spirit by your word and by the mechanisms that you have put in place through the 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 sacraments and the body of Christ who prays together, who, who decide, uh, di dis discusses and, and disciples others in the word of God, who, who pray and who fellowship one with another, understanding that our fellowship truly is with you. Lord, that when we meet together, there you are in the midst of us, and there we are truly meeting and having fellowship with you. Let that reality set in that we are not Lone Ranger Christians, but to be the most effective, to be complete, to be entire, wanting nothing. It must be done by the truth of your word. And the truth of your word says you've come to establish your church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. God we realize and recognize that you have set us apart, that you have sanctified us for this time, for this moment, for this season, in this place, for us to do the work that you call this church to do. So God, I pray, just like James tells us, God, we need the wisdom to know how and who and when and where to go, God, that we could reach any of those who will call on you. Lord, we pray for your wisdom, your guidance, your counsel, your, your empowering that only comes through your Holy Spirit, God. We ask this in Jesus' name.